Good morning. Lovely day in Sarasota. We are excited to be here. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I also want to recognize some of our guests. Please have a seat. We're excited about today's announcement. Uh, and I want to thank the State College of Florida for hosting us here uh, in Sarasota. I also want to thank the Chancellor of our State University System of Florida, Ray Rodriguez, for being with us today. We're also joined by Chris Rufo, who's the Senior Fellow and Director of the Initiative on CRT with the Manhattan Institute and, and a recently appointed trustee at New College in Sarasota. Emily Sturge, a student at the University of Florida, is joining us here today all the way down uh, from Gainesville. Uh, we'll also have in a few minutes, uh, who's just arriving, our Secretary of the Lottery, John Davis, uh, will be joining us. And then we've got uh, the heavy hitters. Senator Jim Boyd is here. And we've got representatives Buchanan, McFarland, Gregory, Beltran, and Robinson. So and I want to thank uh, Dr. Carol Probesfeld, the president of State College of Florida, Manatee, Sarasota, for hosting us today. We really appreciate your service. So we're proud of what we've been able to do in the realm of education generally, but particularly with higher education. Uh, since I've been governor, we've not allowed any tuition increases at any of our state universities. And so you can actually go, I think the average tuition is maybe about $6,200 as a Florida resident. Of course, we have things like Bright Future Scholarships where you can either get all of that or most of that uh, paid for based on your merit. Uh, we're proud of that. We're proud to make it affordable because uh, having all this debt is obviously a dead end for so many students. We're also proud to be ranked number one for public higher education by U.S. News and World Report. We've been number one for five years in a row, and that's not just our universities. That's also our state colleges. And one of the reasons we rank one is affordability because we make it affordable, and I think that that's something very, very important. We do have right now uh, the lowest tuition and fees anywhere in the country. And so we're proud of that. At the same time, if you look around the country, and Florida is not immune to this, uh, there's really a debate going on about what is the purpose uh, of higher education, particularly publicly funded higher education systems. And I think you have the dominant view which I think is, is not the right view, but the dominant view is the, the uh, use of higher education under this view is to impose ideological conformity, to try to promote political activism, and that that's what a university should be. Uh, that's not what we believe is appropriate in the state of Florida. Instead, we need our higher education system to focus on promoting academic excellence, the pursuit of truth, and to give students the foundation so that they can think for themselves. Now, if you see the former approach is dominant throughout the country, particularly with respect uh, to academia, you see it manifested in a lot of different ways, but more recently you see it manifested in things like DEI bureaucracies. And this is basically a component of the administration within universities that are imposing a political agenda, sometimes things like critical race theory. Uh, these bureaucracies are hostile to academic freedom, and really they constitute a drain on resources and end up contributing, certainly around the country, to higher costs as these bureaucracies metastasize. You will see, flowing from that, mandatory things like mandatory DEI training, and that is really imposing an agenda on people. You know, we passed legislation last year, the Stop Woke Act, uh, which basically said that, you know, if you're an employee, particularly of like private business, uh, you have a right to opt out of that. They can't force that on you. They're, that's litigating it. You know, we, this is what happens every time, you know, we um, usually win these on appeal. So, so, so that's going to happen. And, and that's important. They also will do things like require 
uh, diversity statements is what they call it, but that's basically like making people take a political oath. And in fact, that has been applied across the country so that if a candidate for a position at a university says, you know, my view is to treat everyone the same regardless of the color of their skin, that they get points off for saying that, that you have to embrace things like critical theory, like the idea of implicit bias and all those other things, and, and that's just not, not appropriate. So, so that has been something that has been happening. So what we did earlier this year, right after the inauguration, we requested from all colleges and universities in the state of Florida uh, to report the amount of money that they are using in things like DEI and CRT programs, including administrative staff, activities, uh, the whole nine yards. And so that report, um, you know, they've reported that, and it's a lot of money, and it's not the best use of your money. And so part of the reason why we're here is we're going to do something about that. Uh, you see the growth of administrative bloat around the country with higher education, and it dwarfs what they're spending on people that actually teach our students. How do you want to have this massive growth in bureaucracy and then not have uh, see the money flow to where it really matters in the classroom. So we're going to do something about that too. And I think about how did this happen where all this administrative bloat has been allowed to have? Part of it is because they take out the loans and they know you get these loans. So they have the kids take out more loans. They're not really improving the academic performance. Either. They're expanding bureaucrats and administrative staff and trying to impose an agenda through that way. So, so that is a failed model, and we want to make sure that that's not what's happening uh, here in the state of Florida. I'm grateful to be here at the State College of Florida because we have 28 state colleges. Many of them are doing really, really good things. I mean, this is part of the engine. We're producing more nurses. We've put a lot of emphasis on that because we see the shortage that you have. So we've had a huge increase in that. Do things like uh, CDL, commercial driver's license. When I became governor, we were producing about 600 truck drivers a year in the state of Florida through our programs. Now we have the ability to do 3,500 truck drivers a year. We see it in mechanics. All these different things that are really in high demand and that are really, really useful for powering an economy, particularly an economy like ours, which has outperformed the nation uh, pretty much every month for the last two years. And so, so that's great. We appreciate what they're doing. But they also recently all signed, all state colleges signed a, 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 a pledge to say that they are not going to have any indoctrinating programs like DEI and CRT on their campuses. And so that's great leadership, and we want to thank them for doing it. So we have more work to do. Last year, we signed a bill for really positive higher education reforms. It did things like dismantle the monopoly accreditation agencies have had on our higher education system. We think that there should be choice in the accreditors because these accreditors aren't accounted, accountable to anybody, and yet they can wield huge amounts of power in terms of what is allowed to be happening uh, on our university campuses. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that students going from a state college to a state university uh, could have a seamless transition in terms of their courses, counting, and all that. Very, very important because you can come uh, here for two years, and then you can go to University of South Florida or, or Florida State or do whatever, and that's fine, and that's a great pathway, so we want to do that. And then probably the most important uh, we brought a, accountability for tenured faculty. Now, all tenured faculty at our state universities must undergo review every five years and can be let go if they are not performing to expectations. <laughs> so we need to do more. And so today, we're announcing a series of proposals uh, to continue to lead in the area of higher education. The first thing that we're going to propose is we want to make sure that everybody that goes through a Florida university uh, has to take certain core course uh, requirements that's really focused on giving them the foundation so that they can think for themselves. And the core curriculum must be grounded in actual history, the actual philosophy that has shaped Western civilization. Um, our institutions will be graduating students, I think, with degrees that are going to be meaningful. We don't want students to go through at taxpayer expense 
and graduate with a degree in zombie studies. And so this is going to make a difference. We are also going to eliminate all DEI and CRT bureaucracies in the state of Florida. No funding, and that will wither on the vine. And I think that that's very important because it really serves as an ideological filter, a political filter. You've seen different things. I mean, New College has really embraced that, and that's part of the reason I think it hasn't been successful and the enrollment's down so much, uh, because I think people want to see uh, true academics, and they want to get rid of some of the uh, political window dressing that seems to accompany all this. So that's no longer going to be uh, in the state of Florida, and I think we probably are the first state uh, that's actually leading uh, by example. But I can tell you those bureaucracies are not representative of what the people of this state and the taxpayers of this state want. We're also going to propose, so yes, we have the five-year review of all the tenured faculty, which is, which is good, and you can have, and the Board of Trustees has to determine whether they stay or go, but you may need to do review more aggressively than just five. So we're gonna give the boards of trustees and the presidents of the universities the power to call a post-tenure review at any time. And so maybe you're in year three, but there's a need to do it, so we wanna do that. And I've talked with folks around uh, the country who've been involved in higher ed reform, and the most significant deadweight cost at universities is typically unproductive tenure faculty. And so why would we want to saddle you as taxpayers with that cost if we don't have to do that? We also want to power university presidents to make hiring decisions for their university by reestablishing their authority over the hiring process. Actually, what happened, you would think that that would be the case, but what happens now, a lot of this is done by faculty committees. And, you know, if they have a certain worldview that they want to promote, those are the candidates that they're going to bring in. And if you don't toe that line, you're not going to get hired uh, to be able to go through that process. And so now you're going to have the universities to be able, the presidents are going to be able to go out, recruit directly. Uh, boards of trustees will be able to do a, a lot of this approving directly. And that's going to make a huge, huge difference in terms of making sure not only we have high quality faculty, uh, but we're not implying some type of ideological litmus test to be able to be hired in the first place. We believe that uh, doing things to help our job market is important. That's why one of the proposals we're going to do is we are going to increase the standards for our preeminent state research universities so that they have to do annual research expenditures of at least $50 million on STEM programs or business partnerships that will directly increase the ability for Florida students to become gainfully employed. We have space, aerospace, aeronautical, all these great things that are going on, and we want to make sure that it's our students that are providing a pipeline to those and not students uh, from out of, look, out of state can come, but I mean, you don't want a situation, oh, this Florida students aren't prepared for this. No, they're going to be, they are prepared. They're going to be even more prepared, and we're really, really uh, happy with that. One of the things we also did earlier on in my term, first term as governor, we were able to send some of the legislative leaders and some of the university presidents at the time up to Princeton uh, University in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, to meet with Professor Robbie George, who has the James Madison Center for Constitutionalism. And so what they're able to do through that center is they're able to offer courses that are really fortifying students' understanding of the Western tradition, of the American experiment, of our constitutional tradition, and all the things that I think have really been lost uh, over the last generation. And so they were able to go up and do that. We established a couple years ago an institute at Florida State, and then we also uh, established an institute at Florida International in Miami called the Adam Smith Center. And those are modeled after what they were doing at Princeton. Very popular program, too, because it's, it's actually authentic stuff and people can kind of get away from the politicization in the rest of the curriculum. And then last year's budget, we were able to sign uh, an appropriation to establish at the University of Florida in Gainesville the Hamilton Center. And so the Hamilton Center is modeled after the other two, uh, but we're actually going to be able to have that be its own college on the University of Florida campus by 
2024. It's going to have its own building, dorms, classrooms, and it's going to be able, all three of these centers are going to be able to have a pipeline directly into those centers for faculty recruitment and uh, have the trustees recruit people to go directly there. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you want these things to be different from what the kind of orthodoxy is. And then if it ends up just being this taken over the same stuff, then it's really not worth having it. And so we think that this is going to be really, really uh, significant. And this is just an important mission because I think the more we're centering higher education on uh, integrity of the academics, excellence, pursuit of truth, teaching kids to think for themselves, not trying to impose an orthodoxy, you are going to see people flooding into these institutions because there's a desire for Because I think a lot of people realize, you know, academia writ large across the country has really lost its way, um, particularly over the past year. I mean, honestly, when I was in school, you had some, but it's gotten a lot worse in terms of trying to impose orthodoxy. So people want to be in a situation where they can send their kids to a university or college and not have to worry about kind of, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is going on. Like, yeah, it'll be a good foundation. It'll help them go. So, and I think that's what you've seen with some of the things that we did last month or earlier this month with New College to be able to put a lot of trustees on that board. You know, this was a college that the legislature uh, thought about just mothballing or folding it into UF or USF or something like that. It's not been able to have the enrollment uh, that you would want, the test scores. There, been, there was a report, I think, a couple years ago that came out that was very withering kind of in the criticism. And here's the thing. If it was a private school making those choices, it's fine. I mean, what are you going to do? But this is being paid for by your tax dollars. And I can tell you, I've talked to people who live in Sarasota who didn't know what New College was. And in statute, it's supposed to be, in Florida statutes, it's supposed to be our premier honors liberal arts college in the state of Florida. And yet nobody even knows what it is. And so the mission has been, I think, more into the DEI, CRT, the gender ideology, rather than what a liberal arts education should be. And so we're going to be able, I think, to, to, to offer uh, some reforms that are really, really going to be positive. And when we announce the trustees, I mean, you have people asking, how do I apply? The professors are asking, how am I able to come join? Because they want to get out of the stuffy environment that pervades so many university campuses. And so uh, I think those, um, those changes have been positive. I think they have a board meeting later today in Sarasota, which will be very, very interesting. But what we're doing is we're putting our money where our mouth is. And so I'm working with the legislature. We're going to be very soon when the LBC meets, which I think is going to meet pretty soon within the next few weeks, uh, the legislature has agreed to authorize immediately $15 million for new college for recruiting new faculty and for scholarships uh, for students. And so you're going to have a situation where you're going to be able to go out, recruit people to come, say, hey, here's the mission. Here's what we're looking to do. Is this something that appeals? And I think you're going to be able to get a lot, a lot of good people to do it. And what's going to end up happening in the budget is there's going to be recurring $10 million every year for new college, for faculty recruitment, and for faculty salaries. And I think that's, that's important. And I can tell you this, you have people who are interested in, in donating money now. They want to endow professorships and all this stuff. And so it just shows you if the, if the mission is sound, people really respond to it. But it's not just new college and our budget we are going to put in $100 million for recruiting and retention of highly qualified faculties, at, at faculty members at all of our state universities. And so you're not spending the money on DEI bureaucracies. You're spending the money on bringing really good people in that are going to be able to teach our university students. So I think that that makes much more sense from a financial perspective, and it's much more mission-oriented in terms of what we're trying to do. So. I don't think there's any state in the country uh, that's been leading on the issue of higher education the way the state of Florida has had, although I think you can say that on many issues um, over the last however many years where Florida leads um, on time and time again. But it's important, and it's important that your tax dollars are funding institutions that you can be proud of. 
the mission that you can you can have confidence in, and I think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see some some really positive results very quickly at a new college, and I think this will be able to build off the momentum that we have in higher education all across the state. So stay tuned. These guys are going to be back in legislative session uh, coming up in March. There's going to be a lot of activity, a lot of great things, but one of the things that is going to be done are these very important higher education reforms. Okay, Ray Rodriguez, Chancellor of the State University System, you're up. Thank you, Governor, and good morning. You know, I would begin by just uh, hitting two of the points that the governor has mentioned because I don't want you to leave without remembering this. For the last five years, Florida has been ranked number one in the country, the State University System of Florida, in quality of higher education. And this year, we became the most affordable higher education in the entire country. So we're delivering the highest quality at the lowest possible cost to our students. Now that's possible because we have the support of our governor and we have the support of the legislature. They've made a significant investment into our higher education system that has enabled us to keep it accessible through low cost and to raise the quality of the education that we're obtaining. Florida is leading in higher education. If you look around the country, other states have abandoned their university systems. In fact, because Florida has held the line on tuition going all the way back to 2013, we have situations now where students can leave the state where they are, come to Florida, enroll in one of our state universities, pay out-of-state tuition, which as all of you know is higher than in-state tuition, get a better quality of education than they would have received if they stayed home, and still pay less than if they had stayed home and gone to their own flagship university. That's how great the value of a Florida education is. And so thank you to the legislature, thank you to the governor. We are rejecting the mistakes that other states are making. The two largest systems, or two of the largest systems in the country, University System of California and University System of Illinois, have pioneered this concept of DEI statements, which is essentially a litmus test that applicants have to sign pledges to in order to be hired, promoted, or granted tenure. Now, first off, the U.S. Supreme Court said government-compelled speech was unconstitutional. They said that in the 1950s. Yet these state institutions are requiring it. It's wrong. And it is a political litmus test of ideology so that they only bring in those who fit whatever the dominant ideology is on those campuses, and we all know what that is. In Florida, we reject that. In Florida, we are a marketplace of ideas. We believe in pursuing academic excellence, and that is our goal. We will be focused on academic excellence at all of our institutions, and we pursue, pursue the goal of education, and we reject indoctrination. Thank you for your time. It's great to be with you. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about DEI and what it really means, because many of you probably heard of it at first a few years ago. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. That sounds great. Include a wide range of people, treat people equally, and make sure that people of a variety of backgrounds feel included. Uh, but this is a lie. It is an Orwellian misuse of language that manipulates you into feeling that this is a good thing, while under the surface it's something quite different. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a very quick lesson in what it really means and what it looks like in universities. I've reported on it elsewhere, and I'm going to be starting to report on it here in Florida. Beginning on Thursday, I'll be releasing one report per week exposing what's really happening in these DEI departments here in this state. Um, I'm going to warn you, it's pretty ugly stuff. And the idea is quite simple. They take the ideologies of critical race theory, radical gender theory, they divide the world into oppressor and oppressed, and then they actually train students, faculty and staff members here in the state of Florida, that certain people are oppressors, certain people are oppressed. Um, they have scholarships that are racially segregated in which, for example, white students are barred from applying, um, which last I checked should be illegal under the Civil Rights Act, and yet they're doing it. They're doing it very publicly, uh, and they're proud of what they're doing. And so, you have also stuff like, uh, you know, training kids to, to feel guilt and shame for their white privilege. Something that I saw at Florida State that surprised me, it was a new one, also shaming Christian students, 
saying that they're guilty of, quote, religious oppression, and they need to atone for their, quote, Christian privilege. That was a new twist on that. Um, and, And these are the kind of programs that are driven by the bureaucracy. And I've talked to a lot of folks in the bureaucracy. I've done a lot of reporting on this. And here's the basic fact, and here's how I think it's going to change with this initiative. The bureaucrats feel like they run the show. They feel like they're in charge. They feel like they're the authorities. And just by exposing what they're doing, they feel like the the public is intruding. That's not how it's supposed to work. These are public institutions supported by taxpayers, and they're governed by the legislature. Uh, They're governed by the public officials. And so what I think is really important here, you have an ideology of diversity versus ideology of equality, treating people equally. We can have that philosophical debate, and we should, because most people, once they understand what's happening, would oppose this DEI ideology. But the deeper context and the deeper importance of this initiative, it's reestablishing public control and public authority over the public universities. Um, And so look, you can have two different kinds of people. You can have rule by the bureaucracy or rule by the people. And in many states, they've opted for the former. But in Florida, with this bold initiative, the governor and the legislators are saying, no, no, no. We see the problem. We're understanding the problem. We're going to reestablish the rule of the people over our institutions. And it's deeply unfair for every Uber driver, waitress, and mechanic in the state of Florida to take money out of their paycheck, to then funnel that money to these DEI bureaucracies that are a total waste of money, but even worse, training people in an ideology uh, that is harmful to kids, harmful to, to faculty, and harmful to staff. And so behind the scenes, I've spent the last few weeks as a new trustee here at New College talking to students, faculty, and staff, and they won't say it publicly but because they're intimidated by their colleagues and by these bureaucrats. But privately, they'll say, these DEI bureaucracies add nothing to the kids' education. They, they filter out faculty on the basis of ideology. You actually have to sign a loyalty oath to radical race and gender theory in order to just be considered for employment. Um, and then they actually harm students because they limit the discourse. They restrict the open and free debate. And so we have a, a, a chance, though, to reestablish the the authority of the public, and also just to remind people that the purpose of the university is not to push political activism. It's to train good students, good citizens in pursuit of knowledge, in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful. And I think that the DEI officers are unfortunately uh, 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 totally against this. And so uh, uh, I'm excited in in my role, in a couple hats, in my role as an investigative journalist, going to be actually showing you what this stuff means, what it looks like the actual ideas underneath the surface of euphemism. Um, But also as a trustee at New College, I think you're going to see, we're going to have a board meeting later today, maybe some of the media is going to come with us. I think you're going to see us modeling uh, the new standard that's being set. And that's really what this all boils down to. The governor has the courage to set a new standard. The legislators have the courage to set a new standard and back it up with an investment and say, this is going to be a place where equality, merit, and colorblindness are the law of the land. You know? And so it's very simple. Equality means treating everyone equally, regardless of their background, regardless of their identity. Merit means that we're going to prioritize the, the excellence of scholarship, the excellence of thinking, rather than uh, what you look like or where your ancestors came from. And colorblindness means that every principle, every system of governance, every decision in the university, should not play favorites on the basis of race or identity or politics, but should treat everyone equal. That's what I think this country is about. That's what we've been fighting for. Uh, We've been drifting away from it, and I'm so excited to be part of this great movement, to reestablish it and send a beacon to all the other states in the country. You can actually change this stuff. Conservatives for many decades have been too scared to deal with the problems of the universities. And I know for a fact, scholars at, at Princeton, University of Chicago, University of Texas, Uh, And other, uh, Stanford and other Ivy League institutions have been calling me, publicly endorsing this initiative, uh, and also saying we're we're looking to Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, um, as a a bright spot to model for every other college in this country what can be done, how to lead, and how to establish this standard. So thank you. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the legislators. I'm excited to get to work. What an honor to be here. And first off, for the record, unlike our president, I don't have teleprompters telling me what to say. 
My name is Emily Sturge, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Florida. And sadly, my university has fallen corrupt to the woke ideals being taught by leftist professors in the classroom. I have professors who are telling me that America is the most racist nation. I have professors who are lecturing the importance of the COVID vaccine instead of actual coursework. And I have professors who are telling me that in this country, women have no rights. Me, I'm a woman. I'm up here today on the stage with Governor DeSantis. I think, I think I'm doing just fine. <laughs> Courses at public universities have essentially become how to be a leftist 101. And students, as these professors are lecturing these woke ideals, students are in the classrooms and they're nodding. And students like me who speak out and offer a differing perspective, I'm vilified by those students. When I set foot on my campus two years ago, I made a promise to myself. I would stay true to my conservative values and I would remain steadfast in my faith. If there's two things that matter to me in this world, it's my faith in my country and my faith in my God. Amen. And just saying, just saying those things, <laughs> just for that belief is putting a target on my back, on my campus. I've been vilified by other students on my campus. I've been called every name in the book. I've been called, for being proud to be an American, I've been called racist. I've been called xenophobic. I've been called misogynistic, anti-woman. You name it, I've been called it but I'm going to wear those names as a badge of honor because they sound an awful lot like what the fake news media is calling DeSantis. <laughs> so not only have I been under attack by students, I've also been under attack by professors, and I'm seeing that in the grades I'm receiving in my research papers. Last year, I wrote a research paper about the importance of women learning how to conceal carry and the importance of the Second Amendment as a tool of empowerment. I received an F. On another paper, I took a little bit of a different approach. I wrote about the wonderfulness of Marxism, and I received a 98, and compliments from my professor. So the ultimate takeaway there is what students are learning in the classroom, that's the future of our country. What students are learning from these professors, these students are gonna take that. In the next 10 years, we're gonna see that in our country, we're gonna see that in the workforce. These students are gonna be leading government. I'm proud to say, that after two years of being on my college campus, still a conservative, I still, I still have faith in God. <laughs> I've survived the wokeism at least for two years, <laughs> and I'm proud to be here today. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for letting me share my story, and thank you, Governor DeSantis, for the initiatives for bringing light to this issue on my campus and so many others. Thank you so much for listening to my story, and God bless. Well, good morning, everyone. I, um, I am grateful to be here today uh, with Governor DeSantis, uh, Chancellor Rodriguez, uh, Chris, and, and others uh, to, to really to be a part of rolling out this initiative, which I think is very important uh, to not just the people of the state of Florida, but to be able to show this nation uh, the work that this governor and working with the legislature are doing uh, to make sure that we do keep a free Florida. Uh, as secretary of the Florida Lottery, uh, one of the things, our mission and what we're tasked with doing is being able to provide resources, additional funding uh, to help uh, students here in this state to be able to attend uh, colleges, our universities, as well as our vocational schools. And those things are important. And one of the things that the governor I can recall when he first, uh, when we had a chance to sit down and to talk about uh, this opportunity, you know, it was something that the governor said that was very important to me and stood with me. He believes in the alignment of education and workforce and business. He wants to make sure that every student in this state has an opportunity to be able to achieve a post-secondary uh, degree and or diploma uh, or certification. And those things is what we're working hard to do and working with the Department of Education, as well as other of, of our sister agencies to make sure that we're maximizing the resources and the tools that we have, and that this governor and working with the legislature is providing us to make sure that we're taking care of these students. And that's what's important. It's not about being able, taking DEI and or those things uh, that I believe is something, you know, that, that's relevant. And, and relevant in the sense of 
DEIs we spoke about. It's something, if you look at this governor and what he's been able to do in his appointment, the individuals that he's brought on to be a part of his administration, it's not about whether you're just black or whether you're Hispanic. It's about doing the right thing, finding individuals who have the skill set, who are prepared to carry out the agenda of this state and of the people. This governor is leading by example, and he is showing not just us, but he's showing the nation what higher education is all about. And that's what we ought to be focused on. And there's a time and place and discussion, as Chris mentioned, to talk about DEI and to talk about whatever we want to talk about. But I don't think it's something that should be in our school system. We want to continue to focus on educating our students and making sure that they are prepared to compete in this world. That's what it's about at the end of the day. And I'm grateful to be a part of this administration, and not just being a part of this administration, but to be able to work with our sister agencies, to work with our leaders here, and to do everything that's possible to take care and to make sure that our students are prepared to be great and to live their dreams here in the greatest country known to mankind. And before I leave, I just want to tell you that stay tuned. We're going to be rolling at the direction of, of Governor DeSantis. The, the, the uh, Department of Lottery is working with the Department of Education, and we're going to be rolling out an initiative called Keep Florida's Future Bright. One of the things that the governor spoke about is the need to create more awareness around our Bright Future Scholarship. I was fortunate to receive a four-route scholarship to play football at Florida State University. But I knew early on that I needed to prepare myself on the field as well as off the field and in the classrooms in order to get that scholarship and have the opportunity. And I had that opportunity knowing that it existed. This is something in which the governor and the legislature continue to fund and we're able to make, we want, he wants to make sure that every student, not just the students, but the parents, the guardians, the organizations throughout the, the various communities in this state understand that there is opportunity. And we want to make sure that every kid starting in middle school has an opportunity to recognize what those requirements are around the Bright Future Scholarship. So Commissioner Diaz and myself, we're going to be working with our teams at the direction of the governor to travel this state and focus on things that are important and relevant. You know, the governor and the legislature approved the financial literacy bill, and that's something that we ought to be talking about. What's the impact of that bill on the students and on the kids and on the families here in this state versus constantly having conversations about things that we can discuss outside of our universities and our colleges? Thank you, Governor. I want right. you to continue to lead. Probably that we had the best year at Florida State in quite some time. They uh, may be on the upswing here. You predicting big things? We're making a move. Okay. All right. We, we, we need to. So we, um, you know, we're excited about being able to, you know, to lead, lead on these issues. Um, I think it's really, really important. And I think that the taxpayers of Florida deserve our best efforts across all these institutions. And Chris Rufo kind of mentioned that, you know, there are some people that think, you have a right to have taxpayer institutions with no accountability, that they should just be able to do whatever they want. Uh, that is not happening here in the state of Florida. We're going to hold people accountable uh, when they're using your resources. And so I think it's uh, exciting, bright, and Masha has an unrelated question or a related question? Okay, okay. Well, Ma Masha, with respect, there aren't very many publicly funded liberal arts colleges. I mean, that's just a reality. Most of them are private. Uh, Forbes magazine did a ranking of all our publicly funded higher education institutions, state colleges and universities. They said New College was the worst return on investment of any other university that we're funding. And here's the thing. It is by statute supposed to be the premier honors college in Florida. That's the mission clearly hasn't met that mission because our premier students are going to UF or some of our other schools. And so I think this is going to really reorient it in a very positive way. I think you already have. I mean, Chris could maybe say 
these trustees are getting asked, how do I join the faculty? They want to come. Isn't there? there's a lot of, lot of interest um, in doing this. And a lot of it is just aligning the mission with what uh, you know, education really should be. And quite frankly, uh, if we were here at almost any other period in our history, no one would even really question it. It's really just more recently in recent decades that, that the mission is kind of veered. And so New College isn't unique in that. But I think we have an opportunity to do really, really well. And think about how many times have you had $15 million going into the kitty so that you're going to be able to recruit faculty immediately? You're going to be able to make a really good difference. You're going to be able to offer scholarships for students. Who, uh, who are high performing. This is something, so we want the institution to succeed. Uh, if we didn't, we would just say to starve it of funding. So we are working, but I think it's got to be towards the mission that really matters. We've also said that uh, if there's students who are there who may don't like the direction, you know, they should be able to transfer students who, who did maybe an early decision with next academic year. They should be let out of that if they don't think. But I tell you, there's way more people who now want to apply than who wish they hadn't applied. And I think you're going to see with the things that happen going forward, you're going to see a lot of interest in that. When, when colleges and higher education, when they embrace a, a more classical mission, people do respond to that. I think it's very clear. So just forget about even what I think or you think about what higher education should be. Just from a market perspective, this is an underserved uh, group that if you're serving that, you're going to see the benefits. And so I'm really, really excited about it. They're going to have a meeting today. And this is going to be, I think, their first board meeting, right, since all this started. So you're going to see a, a lot of really, really good stuff. Yes, sir, in the back. I mean, I think there should be no ideological litmus test when you have these big companies that have the decision to make or break uh, a, a news network or any type of network. And they'll give different rationales for why they don't want to do it. But the reality is they have so much other content that is very lightly viewed, and yet they keep that on. And it seems it's the One America News and the Newsmax who are being targeted. Uh, so I think it does warrant an investigation. I mean, I think probably the Congress and the House would probably be best equipped to do it. We have helped all these uh, organizations who've been under pressure since I've been governor, and if there are things we can do. But I really think this is something that the Congress needs to look at, and I think that they need to ensure that there's um, you know, not intellectual uh, discrimination going on when it comes to what people are able to view. Yes? So look, I think, I think we've been a trendsetter for many for K through 12. I mean, our school choice, you now see that exploding across the country, what we've done in charter schools, what we've done to ensure education, not indoctrination in our curriculum, such as the dealing with the gender ideology and the CRT. So you're seeing more and more of that. I think higher education has just been something where they kind of just let it go and leave it to its own devices. And I think here we're showing that, no, you need vision from the people of the state. And the people's vision is able to be articulated through the people that they elect to the legislature and to the governor's office. And I would encourage other like-minded states uh, to follow our lead and to, and to look into making these really common sense reforms. Well, look, what I would just say is this. Um, I roll out of bed. I have people attacking me from all angles. It's been happening for many, many years. And if you look at the good thing about it, though, is like if you take a crisis situation like COVID, you know, the good thing about it is when you're an elected executive, you have to make all kinds of decisions. You've got to steer that ship. And the good thing is, is that the people are able to render a judgment on that, whether they reelect you or not. And I'm happy to say, you know, in my case, not only did we win re-election, we won with the highest percentage of the vote that any Republican governor candidate has in the history of the state of Florida. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
We won by the largest raw vote margin, over 1.5 million votes, than any uh, governor candidate has ever had in Florida history. And in fact, we almost doubled the previous record, which I think was like 780,000 vote margin. And so what I would just say is uh, that verdict has been rendered by the people of the state of Florida. And yeah, because I mean, we're, we're gonna, you know, we've already done, well, what do you mean by gender-based care? You mean like sex change operations? Well, I know, but I'm just saying, I don't think we use that term, you use it, so I'm asking you to define it. Do you include puberty blockers in that? Okay, so, I mean, look, you have, and this is sad, but this is going on, you're having, in our, in our society, they're giving teenagers, kids, puberty blockers. They're changing, their, they're doing sex change operations. And so we actually have very you know, young adults who went through this when they were minors, and they're saying this was a huge mistake. And in fact, it's not evidence-based when you start talking about sex changes and puberty blockers. So we've worked through our department or our um, medical licensing board to say that you in the state of Florida, if you're performing uh, those procedures, um, on these minors, uh, you're going to lose your medical license here in Florida. So that is happening. <laughs> We're also going to work with the legislature to make sure that we put that into statute so that you're able to have, uh, have accountability in that sphere. So when you're talking about publicly funded institutions, you know, those are not things that I think are an appropriate use of your tax dollars. And I do think, unfortunately, you have seen this done at some publicly funded things. You know, five years ago, I don't think anyone even knew this was going on or talked about it, certainly not 10 years ago. Now it's become kind of a cottage industry. And I think what the research has shown in places like Sweden and other places, they reverse course on going down that direction. They started, and no, that's not right. Because you have, these are young, very young people um, and they have all kinds of things that go on, you know, when you're in those years. The way to deal with that, and most of it resolves itself by the time they become adults, but the way to deal with that uh, is to provide whatever counseling is needed, not to hack off their body parts. That is not a solution to the problem. That is <laughs> mutilation, and it is wrong. Well, thanks, everybody. We will be back soon, and uh, we, love, uh, we love Sarasota very much. Thank you.